Hello, friends, and welcome to Adventures in Pixie Land. We are in Bible study. We are in part two for the day. We are still, of course, in the Niv, um, as we will be through next year as well. And then we will switch over to the KJV. We are in Hebrews, which, remember, is a letter written by somebody who was in the uh, raised in the Jewish faith and has converted, like, in their faith, you know, every good little Jewish boy is supposed to seek his Messiah. Excuse me. And this one did. He found Jesus, and he is talking to other people who feel the same way, who converted already, who are being pressured to move back to the faith of their fathers, which is part of that stuff. And so this guy is writing to people in the same faith that he was grew up in about how they come from people who have faith, who have these this hall of fame, if you will, of faith, but people don't like this, not real good energy, because it's not supposed to be a competition. It's not like for show, it's for heart. But he's kind of doing the, do you remember who we come from? And I've used that before, realistically, in life with people. Looking at them going, look, I'm telling you my brain works like your brain and you think you can't do anything and then I want you to come in here and look at my wall of degrees and tell me what you can't do when I'm telling you that your brain, which is why you think you can't do it, is like mine. Yes, you can. You just have to find your path. It's not going to look like anybody else's because we're not all neurodivergent in the same way. So each of us has to find our path. But it's possible. What do you want to do? Don't try to make yourself do something that's not your path you can't absorb somebody else's life path you need to be happy in your life so i you know i usually ask for people's goals so i can understand how i'm helping them if i can help them because sometimes i can't so hebrews uh verse uh with chapter 11 uh verse 31 uh by faith the prostitute rahab because she welcomed the spies was not killed with those who were disobedient uh e or unbelieving this is, you're talking about Old Testament. Okay. Um, and what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weaknesses were turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed armies. Yeah, uh, God in the Old Testament, God sort of had this uh, habit of uh, giving his chosen prophets uh, superpowers. Like they did super speed, super strength, all kinds of like where our superhero, uh, you know, comic book stuff. So I've kind of liked it, Move, you know, moving around in the Old Testament. So that's why I decided it, you know, got to do it. It's part of the story. If we don't understand that, we don't understand the full context of this, the full gift of this. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they may gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were changed, chained and put in prison. They were stoned. Uh, F. Uh, some early manufacturers, manu, man, sorry, manufacturers, manuscripts, stoned. They were put to the test. They were sawed in two. Ooh. Or put the, okay, I didn't, then they used to call that put to the test. That, that's a terrible thing. Oh my gosh. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. They were all commend, commended for their faith yet none of them received what we have been promised god had planned something better for us 
so that only together we would be made perfect. Whew. Only together would we be made perfect. So that means like when it all costs just goes right out the window, doesn't it? When it all costs means it's okay to hurt other people. So that if you've got to get, if you've got to hurt other people to get what you want, you are then hurting humanity and you can't ever actually get what you want because you, you like, we all rise together. God's disciples, his sons, verse 12, chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by uh, such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw everything off that hinders the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross scorning its shame and sat down and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God consider him who endures such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart don't make his death be wasted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. You're alive. You haven't died for your faith or anything. Uh, and you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as son. Oh, you have forgotten the word of encouragement that addresses you as son. My son. Do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Hey, uh, Proverbs uh, 3, verses 11 and 12. Um, yeah, okay, so... I know that's a hard thing to hear, uh, but we have to continue to be teachable. We're going to have a lot of energy thrown at us, and it could be very confusing, especially if you're very like energetically sensitive or anything. And the more you uh, get in alignment with God, the more energetically sensitive, in my opinion, you should expect to be. So you're going to have all these influences. And if you don't consciously choose to keep recentering and keep refocusing on Jesus and keep going, slowing it down, and asking him what you're supposed to do with this, right? That you're gonna get, uh, you're gonna get answers if you slow down and you ask. But if you've messed something up because you didn't slow down and ask, you're not gonna learn if he just forgives you. I mean, because he forgives you, he will, and he does automatically, right? But you're not gonna learn not to do it again. If there's no consequences for your actions, you can promise, and that's good. But you do have to first stop doing it because you're telling him you're sorry for doing it, so you have to stop doing it first, right? And then, you know, you're sorry. I'm sorry implies change behavior, so then you're not doing it again. And then, and then you gotta, you've hurt people, and you're sorry. You can't be sitting in your ego and say, I'm not going to apologize and I'm not going to make right. Well, then you're not sorry because you're sitting in your ego because you don't want to make right. Because if you felt guilty, you can't like help but want to make right. So, you're sorry or are you just sorry you got caught? Those are not the same thing. If you're trying to avoid your punishment, then you're, you're just sorry you got caught. It's gonna like, you know, all that. And I'm not, I'm not saying that that's a condition before God forgives you. I don't get to decide when God forgives anybody. That's not what I have the right to do. I, there is no living person who has the right to do that. It's, it's ridiculous. All right, so uh, uh, verse seven. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. 
For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, everyone, all levels, undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we all have had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and them? So now that's a very particular uh, truthful thing. Uh, I've had a, I've been around a lot of people who well, are parents of a lot of different ages. I've, I do not have my own biological children in this uh, fashion. I have adopted the children and grandchildren. So, you know, I understand some of it. You know, my friends that are my age or older, they're like, yeah, sounds like your kids are being kids. <laughs> like, like it sounds like those who actually have children, it sounds like things that when their children were that age or their children are that age and they're going through the same things. So it's like, okay, good. Because you're just like, child, please, kind of, uh, you know, energy. And that's just parental energy. So that's true. But also I will say the pre-teenage years, regardless of gender type, if you are the same gender as that child, you know, uh, you know, whether it's identifies with biologically, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. It doesn't expect their resistance to be focused on you and not the other parent that they maybe don't identify that way with. And it's just sort of a natural, you see it in the wild, you know, like think of it as the young lion and the old lion. Right, they gotta push those boundaries, and when you push and put them back in their place, so you're teaching them, you know, how far they're allowed to go. You hold firm on what's healthy, you know, in a healthy way. You, you know, you. That's the discipline. That kind of discipline. We're not talking about people who are talking about abuse. Okay, because there's a way to do that and not abuse somebody. It exists. If that if you're not sure what that is, then I then I ask you to go see, you know, go talk to like a child psychologist and talk about healthy communication stuff. They they'll be able to help you. They will. Uh, happy to help you. Matter of fact, because that's why they're in that profession. Uh, moreover, that's verse nine. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we? Submit to the father of our spirits and live. Our uh, fathers disciplined us for a little while where they thought best, as, uh, as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. Like he's not out to get you. That's not what he's doing. He's trying to save you from you, from your dumb mistakes. Because I have to imagine, we look like, like, they say our subconscious minds are between three and seven years old. I say they say, that's psychologists, you know, all that, it, as well as, uh, you know, I'm a hypnotherapist, that's what they say in hypnotherapy world. But they say that because psychologists say that, and, and, you know, like, other therapy type people say that, people with doctorates and stuff, okay? So, I have to imagine, that's about the age we look to God, if we're lucky, the most mature of us, which I am most certainly not, and I'm not trying to make any claims, looks like they're seven years old. I mean, just think about that. Think about some of your friends and some of the behaviors they've had when life has gotten tough, and then figure out an emotional maturity level. Because their instinctual reaction to it, when they have their, their equivalent of a temper tantrum, some people, they lose their temper. No, I have a temper tantrum. Because I try to hold myself accountable. It's part of my system for me. So when they lose their, like when they're pushed that way and they lose their temper and stuff, there they are. That's the age. What, what does that remind you of? What age of a temper tantrum in a child does it remind you of? Because that's the age of their subconscious mind. And I'm not saying make fun of them or do anything. You need to understand that. Because that's what you're dealing with. You're trying to calm them down and they're, they're you know, not, not in control of their emotions. Um, our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we might share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces uh, a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level your paths 
for your feet. Uh, B, Proverbs 4.26, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. So, strengthen your spiritual chops in the face of opposition when people try to tell you that uh, they have a right to tell you how you're allowed to worship your God. Um, I mean, Jesus is the Messiah. And if you believe Jesus is the Messiah, then okay, you've said you're Christian. That's what, you, that's what that means. So not act like it. Even when it's tough. Even when it means you can't get something that looks like it's really fun. And you're looking for those moral equivocations. So, those are those people. I don't care how many people you see do it. If you know it's not right, don't do it. That's what he expects. So they're saying, hold firm. You come from stronger stuff than this. You come from strength of faith without a written law or any mechanism or anything to back it up. Because that's what faith is. Remember your faith today, friends. It's important. It's really actually the most important thing.